Hey guys, we're back for more shenanigans. How's it going, everybody? Getting close, getting close to Christmas now. Yeah, Christmas time of the explosions, presents, bootleg toys, and other wonderful things. Yeah, it's the time of giving, sometimes a time of taking up to $260 million worth of negotiable bearer bonds. Or taking a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> so if you don't know what today's topic is, uh, we might be looking into a little bit of family matters, because family matters for real. And one of the things Bruce Willis is best known for, of course, is moonlighting, which we will not be talking about tonight, but he's got the haircut and excellent show we're still worth watching today i'm re-watching the entire thing myself at the moment but he's still got that same hair that same 80s style as we go on to die hard 4 live free or cheat hard where he's got god mode infinite weapons no let's get rid of that very quickly because we're going to talk about an actual good film not a shit film um the original die hard yes the original and, and in still my the opinion, best. The best. Well, I it like number best. two and three, but one and two I think are the best, and number three next after that. The rest of them, like the Terminator films, they just they just don't exist. They ignore them. Yeah, they uh, they may exist in another reality, but not ours. <laughs> it's you know, it's just one of those things. You know, you you just can't beat the original. Which isn't always the case, but it is definitely the case when it yeah. comes to, to Die Hard. The yeah, Christmas there's some movies party. where sometimes the sequels are a little better or debatably fans will argue, you know, do I like T1 or two, T2 better or, you know, do I like Alien or Aliens? You know, they both got options, but original Die Hard still a good classic 80s uh, action movie and it's sort of um, swung around from we had the in the old days, we had the old cowboy western heroes, and then we had the uh, 70s anti heroes like your Clint Eastwood and Dirty, Dirty Harry. And then we got a big, sweaty, muscled men like Sly Sloan and Schwarzenegger. And as we got to Die Hard, it came back to the more everyman sort of guy where he's not a big, you know, crazy Hogan Schwarzenegger steroid freak. He's like built like a real person, but he's also. A character of morality who actually gives a fuck and when things go wrong he's gonna stand up and do something and not just take it lying down yeah and um you use the word every man and that's definitely the the key uh to this movie because unlike a lot of those zadies action movies where you do have a a kind of a muscle bound lead like Schwarzenegger murder, death, kill machine. um you know bruce willis he is for all intents and purposes, uh, a fairly average dude. Obviously, he's a good-looking guy and all, but he's not, like, super gassed up and muscly, and, yeah. you know, he doesn't look like you're... He's got a realistic physique, physique not a dude. bodybuilder physique. Exactly, exactly. And I suppose, before we, we, we kind of get into it, um, just in case, because, you know, there always will be somebody, I guess, somewhere at some time who may not have seen this this movie... It's a it's an action thriller. Um, you know, it's about a a kind of down on his luck New York cop who goes to visit his family in LA for Christmas and attends his wife's uh, Christmas party at the office she works at, which unfortunately also happens to be the site of a a terrorist uh, <laughs> operation, for want of a better term. And you know, I mean, lots terrorists of, having um, a party too, by the looks. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, lot, lots of crazy stuff uh, happens, and our poor old lead John McClane just gets um, he gets himself into a situation nobody expected. He's a fly in the ointment. He's a monkey in the wrench. <laughs> it's uh, the wrong but, place, <laughs> the wrong time, but the right guy. <laughs> so yeah, look, we'll 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 get into it. We'll we'll go through it. We'll we'll hit you with our favorite moments and. I was going to say not so favorite moments, but I don't even think I have. I can't think of a bad, a bad moment in this movie. I think I enjoy. No, it, it every flows really quickly it. when you watch it. It's, like I start watching it any old time, and it's it, it's finished before I even know it's started. There's, 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 
there's no bad scenes or bad editing or dialogue. It just flows really well. And I, I guess, I don't know, sometimes a long production time and production hell can absolutely ruin a film and being rewritten to death. But in the case of this film, being in production hell for more than a decade worked out in its favour because <laughs> they got it to the best it could be. See here, you know, um, when you're in one of our, our middle screenshots here, it's based on the novel by Roderick Thorpe. Um, I never actually read the book. I know the book has a different name, oh, and uh, it's like slightly the 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 plot slightly altered. Like um, John McLean isn't called John McLean. The character has a different name, and I think as well, he's not going to visit his wife's place of work. It's actually his younger daughter. He's he's coming to visit mm -hmm. over Christmas. So there's a couple of little kind of changes in the in the plot that they actually made for the the movie adaptation but it's probably something i should at some point make an effort to read because usually when you get something like and, and believe me this is one of my favorite movies ever and it's unusual for me to have gone this long without kind of reading the the kind of source material it's it's based on so i should probably put that down on the list of things to do in 2024 yeah, I, I, I've read a number of articles over the years about the original Die Hard and about the source material and whatnot, and I remember the legacy of it going back to the 70s as it was going to be a Frank Sinatra vehicle, and even all the way up until they actually um, optioned and were you know, making this into a real film after being in developed hell, hell and rewritten a bunch of times. Um, when this movie was actually made, they still had to give it the first option to frank sinatra like legally they had to actually ask him and he was like well no because he was he was way too old to be in it at this point so thankfully he wisely chose not to <laughs> be an old man trying to be running around being an action man as oceans 11 days were far behind him yeah and i think the um the frank sinatra connection comes from the fact that die hard book that Die Hard is based on is actually a sequel story to another story called The Detective, which Frank Sinatra actually did, I believe, um, appear in a film adaptation of. I could be wrong there, but there definitely is some type of um, connection. So he did have, um, as you say, um, kind of first refusal to playing the lead role once they yeah. announced that they were going to make um, Die Hard a movie. So um, yeah, there's a little bit of uh, background there, if any of you folks are interested in in kind of looking it up and there is actually a you know there's so you've got your you've got the novel that die hard's based in but then you've also got another novel that, that precedes it as well so if you're and then, you've got, then you've, got the, material there. you've also got the playstation die hard trilogy and the sega saturn arcade dynamite dicker which was a sega arcade beat em up game that so you've got a couple of weird video games many many years later that don't have a whole heck of a lot to do with the um movie but they're good fun to play oh yeah oh yeah so um you know we we will we'll kick off and we're we're introduced to our our lead john mcclain played by the by the wonderful bruce willis and uh he's on he's on the plane he's going to la to to visit the wife and kids for christmas he gets a little bit of friendly uh travel advice from the the passenger sitting beside him and a good way to to cure jet lag is to make fists with your toes mm -hmm. so you know take note everybody those of you who yeah, blood have a long legs. distance yeah i can't really um i can't really say if it does work specifically for jet lag i, I know i just do it every day at lunch time i worked in the factory because the blood would pull so bad and my feet would be so painful i'd take them off i'd get barefoot i'd also lie against the wall and put my legs up against the wall and let it drain with gravity so th doing anything to get the pressure off does might help <laughs> yeah well look there must be there must be some reasoning and rationale behind it i guess you know uh, yeah it's like John think... massage in it yeah, I think John though initially he's he's a bit a little bit skeptical though. We'll get to that later he on is. when he actually does does try it. 
but yeah, so he's um he lands in the airport. He's got his big duck teddy bear with him, which I think in real life is actually belongs to the director John McTiernan. And oh, really? um, hmm. he's Looks got like his, when you he's get the carnival fear. Yeah, it has that kind of look about it. Of um, I've just won this at the at the county fair prize draw. So uh, yeah, he um. He lands, there's a, a limo waiting for him to actually take him to his wife's place of work, which is the, the Nakatomi Plaza. Uh, we definitely get the get the impression earlier on early on that John McLean is just like a, a no nonsense, no fuss type of guy. He um he's clearly a little bit, I suppose a little bit just uncomfortable with the fact that he has to get a limo in the first place instead of just taking a taxi. Yeah. He even opts to sit up front with the driver because uh, he obviously just doesn't feel like totally comfortable being whisked around in a limo. It's actually the the teddy bear that actually gets the, to occupy the back seats and enjoy the you know, <laughs> enjoy the, the <laughs> dalliances of, of what you can get riding in a stretch limo. Um, I so some nice Rose, um, shots of photography for all the sunset too as they're driving in this opening sequence. It's beautiful actually, and it's 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 beautiful cinematography here of, of LA and, and just captures, yeah, captures and that's, and that's the, also what I chucked in the um beginning there. Like just it, it's um just nice seeing that like rosy sunset coming in. Um it's pretty cool. Red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we're also introduced to uh, to Armand, I believe, is the driver, the limo driver. Uh, who Ar- will... Argyle. Argyle, Argyle, yes. He'll, he'll serve we're, as We're not our, having uh, a Maisie situation. <laughs> yeah, we're not having another Tia and Maisie situation. Maisie, Moxie, Biloxie, <laughs> I did that as well when we did our, um, our top five Transformers. I kept on referring to, like... Primacon is Thornathron. I'm just bad when it comes to mixing names of characters up, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Especially with the nonsense names to start with. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Primacon yeah, is so Argyle, Argyle will kind of um, serve as our comic relief at some points during the during the movie later on. He'll, he'll give us a, a few laughs here and there. So yeah, you know, John, he's, he's driven to the Nakatomi Towers over at the Nakatomi Plaza. And once again, we get our, another kind of glimpse at his kind of, you know, he's just kind of gruff and no nonsense. He thinks it's a bit silly that he has to like, even like use this touchscreen keypad to, to look up. So it's his, pretty advanced for back then. It is pretty advanced for back then. Um, he's also quite miffed at the fact that uh, his wife is not actually listed as Holly McLean, she's listed yeah. as her as her former name, Holly Gennaro, which you know the marriage is going through some trouble, as we'll as we'll learn. And this is one of the first kind of clear clear signs we get this yeah. things not. But maybe, we get all these other you know, all these other great M names in there. You got Martinez, Mc, McAlee, McMurphy, and you got um. Looks like Mirren, McDaniels, <laughs> every every possible variation M knows. Yeah, there's parties there. McConnor, which I didn't even know was a name, but there you go. Yeah, yeah all the Max There's return of Max here at Nakatomi Plaza. Do not go to where Macbeth is, because that'll be that guy from Gargoyles and it will mess you up. <laughs> but yeah, it's um we definitely got a real feeling of you know, high tech wealth and opulence being oozed out of the, yeah. the Nakatomi Towers building. Um so you know John he makes his way up to the top floor where the where the Christmas party is being held. Actually before we even get to that, can I just say that the um the security guard at the desk is just a bit of a dickhead because he makes <laughs> John McLean he makes him type in the name of his wife to find out where she is. But after he mentions this that that he's going to the top floor he the the security guards like oh yes the christmas party they're actually the only staff yeah. that's still in the building it's the like, only people in the building you just all on the same that? floor <laughs> yeah why did you make me go <laughs> through this else gone out. yeah you should have just sent me up in the elevator like you know and being mm-hmm. helpful instead of just sitting there and making me you know 
fiddle around with this touch screen yeah, and screen. Yeah. But anyway, rant over. <laughs> we um we got introduced as well. So 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 John he makes his way up to the top floor and to, to see his wife Holly and we're we get to meet Holly, but we also get to meet Mr. Takagi and Alice, the lovable Alice with a little bit of cocaine. Oh, yeah. What, what an example of humanity he is. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's got a little bit of a little bit of white powder on the end of his nose there, which uh, Mr. Takagi yep. has to kind of uh, point out to, to clean off there because as he as he respectfully kind of says, you know, um, this is John McLean, Holly's husband. He's a policeman, you know, so the guy can just get the Iggy to, to get the to get the coke off the end of the nose there, which is very, which is very funny. Very eighties, like they're in this fancy building and like very eighties and Wall Street and um, uh, Miami Vice and that sort of thing. It's like the cocaine's everywhere. Oh yeah, you got you got coke everywhere. You've got like a a gold Rolex watch being gifted to yep. Holly because of how she's performed and. Yeah, we um we established pretty early that this guy Alice is a bit of a creep. He he definitely seems to have the the hots for Holly and he's just one of these kind of braggadocious, cocky eighties businessman types that, you know, you imagine would be pretty unbearable to have to work with on a day to day yep. basis, especially if you're a woman. But uh yeah, it's just it's a great setup and a great introduction to our to some of our main characters before we get into our villainous element being introduced. Mm. We do sneak in and what looks to be some kind of courier or furniture truck. They sneak into the underground car park and the guys are all piled in the back of the terrace. Yeah, they uh the Trojan horse their way in. Um, mm -hmm. A load of them seem to be hiding. It looks like some type of U-Haul or removal van or something like that. But they send um, they send the two guys in in the front. Uh, there's the guy who's going to be like their little uh, hack expert, and then you've kind of got um, the kind of second in command heavy to to Hans Gruber, the the tall yeah, blonde. Yeah, the first of the Euro trash. Yeah, yeah. We'll uh, we'll just refer to them as being European. We'll try not to pinpoint any nationalities <laughs> in case uh, in case we get into trouble. I do but, love um, the strange mix of terrorists they have in the film because they have all the Euro trash guys and they have the um, ones that are from the same region as ha old Hans Gruber of El Alan Rickman. And there's all these other random guys, which I can only assume are basically like mer local mercenaries who just hired to have specialities in technology or whatever because it's such a random grab bag of guys he has yeah and they're um it's not like they're all european either are you like you know the no. the guy there's a couple of americans in there there's like you know an asian guy as well so it's a, it's a little bit of an international mix of uh you know of villains here well i think he's an so, equal opportunity employer all about ellen rickman if you've got the oh, skills definitely. he'll pay you the money oh big time big time so yeah, we got we got the tall German lad whose name is Carl. Uh, we've got, and then Theo is the guy with the glasses who's going to be like the the tech expert. But they they pretty much bamboozle the security guards uh, really easily here. They're having this kind of fake conversation about what's going on with football, and the security guard gets pop, and Theo hops the counter and you know opens the security elevators down below. So hands and the the rest of the crew can can enter the building and this is when we get our first proper look at hans gruber who is yes. the the leader of this gang and he's I'm about just to make a quick a, look a grand entrance i'm having a quick look at the old secret dossier of carl otherwise known as alexander gudinov says he was born in the soviet soviet union and he was went to study ballet, which explains his some um, funny kicks later on in the movie. Um, because I don't really like karate kicks. <laughs> and he was in a um when he was at school, he was also in a class with um Mikhail Bar Barishnikov. Well, that's a bit of trivia I didn't know before. Interesting. Interesting. I always kind of recognize yeah. him from uh there's a, a funny uh, it's like a, a Tom Hanks comedy movie called the the Money Pit. 
he, mm-hmm. he's also in that movie as like an eccentric kind of German composer or something. He's he's pretty hilarious in that. But in in this movie, he's a proper hard man, tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> just you don't want to. You really just don't want to fuck with, with with this guy at all. No, definitely. He not. also has um. He's like a younger brother on the team, who's like the blonde guy with glasses. So there's a bit of a, a family element that's at work here as well. So and, and so yeah, like love, Hans. And, yeah. Another thing I love Die Hard is the amount of um CB radios and telephone conversations we get, which is quite a, quite a significant portion of the movie. Yeah, and once again, something this. If you were to do a a remake of this, which they should That's never the do, by the way, but now. you know, but it <laughs> it would be all different. And you can, well, we you still know, use CB of, radios, like you know, for local communications that aren't going off satellites and hard wires and all that. You know, like police and whatnot, and security still use radios in addition to phones. Something like this was to happen in real life now, or at least be set in modern times. What you'd have is. You just go on the internet and be like, I'm a fucking terrorist, mate. Get up here. Okay, it's all in the first five minutes. All all the hostages would be like live streaming. I'm live streaming what's happening. You can believe me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not the terrorist. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so, look, Hans, he he makes his grand entrance. It's all guns ablaze. He takes, um, you know, Mr. Takagi aside. He wants the codes to the vault. Um, Mr. Takagi, of course, is speculating as to many, many reasons, and like you know, why would he? Why would he want to commit these atrocities? Is he trying to sabotage the company's projects in Indonesia? Is he, you know, what's he after? Is he after secrets to Man. sell for corporate espionage? But no, he's not after any of that. As Hans um, reveals to him what he is interested in solely, he wants the the vault. The company vault to be opened so they can gain access to the 268 million dollars worth of negotiable bearer bonds that are in the they're in the safe so all he wants is the money he just wants the the big bucks that's all he's interested in there's yeah. no political or terrorist motive even though mm-hmm. throughout the film will refer to the group it's all a cover like and look i'm guilty of it myself i will often call the group terrorists but they're not really terrorists they're just thieves really is is, is kind of what their, what their <laughs> MO is so pirates mr takagi um he's a little bit taken aback that that's all they're interested in is the money but anyway he professes that he doesn't he doesn't know the code and he's not willing to give them the code and he's telling them look there's no point in me giving you the code anyway because you know there's all these other fail safes in place that you can't open the vault blah blah, blah blah and um you know, he ends his little speech by more or less saying, look, you, you're you just going to have to kill me, which Alan Rickman, Hans Gruber, does not have a problem with because he, he blows his brains out there and then <laughs> for, for, not, for not handing the, <laughs> the code over. And um, after this, this happens, uh, you know, it's kind of explained to us just what exactly they, they needed the code for. The code was really to open a final lock. They, they, they know that they can get through these other various locks and security um, kind of implementations that they have in place. But Theo, um, he explains, you know, there's like magnetic seals. They're going to need to like drill through and break these locks one at a time. Yeah, it's like and, Uber um, technology, not just a regular vault or so. It's like cutting. Yeah, off. they're not just they're not just going to crack the safe using you know a, a stethoscope and a hammer. You know, there, there's going to be a lot more <laughs> intricate work going. You're going not just going to get Dean, Sma- Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, and a few whiskeys and manage to make off with the dollars. So I suppose it should also be mentioned as well that when when Hans and his crew did make their their big entrance and started causing havoc upstairs. Um, this whole time, John McLean, he actually wasn't out on the floor with the rest of the party goers. He was still kind of um, freshening up from his flight and he was in one of the, the spare rooms out back. So he manages to avoid everything that's kind of happening upstairs with this chaos and manages to slip out and activate a fire alarm, which is pretty quick thinking because it's a good way, you know, especially in back in the day when you don't have like mobile phones or cell phones, it's a good way yeah. to try and get emergency services to a, to a building in a hurry. Um, of course, he's also armed with his trusty Beretta pistol as well, which is like his 
by her arm from being a a New York cop. And uh, we get one of our our, our first, or at least one of my first early uh, favorite moments in the movie, because. So you've got John McClane, he's after setting off this fire alarm. The the guys at the security desk can see where the fire alarm has been activated from. So they send Carl's uh, younger brother, the dude with the glasses, down to investigate what's going on and and see what's happening. And this leads to a brilliant, brilliant confrontation um, where, you know, John McClane and, and the dude get into a real scrap. but there's this great moment or this great line, like right before it all kicks off where John <laughs> McClane is, um, he's come up behind him. He's got the gun to the back of his head and he's like, you know, you're, you're under arrest and this and that. And terrorist guy is like, you are policeman. There are rules for policeman. And John McClane's like, yeah, that's what my captain keeps telling me. <laughs> I always thought that was a, that was a great bit of dialogue. And so there's a big scuffle and um, they end up, uh, it's got a much bigger than flight him. of stairs. Oh, the guy's yeah, the guy's way bigger and stronger than him. Just a big, beefy Euro stud, and uh, yeah, even though he looks like a complete nerd, but that's besides the point. Guys, uh, the yeah, old, they, they have, the old head scissors. That's right. That's right. But it's um, it's a pretty as short. It's a short little violent altercation they have, which leads to them both taking a tumble down a flight of stairs, and unfortunately for. Mr. Terrorist dude, he gets his neck broken, you know, pretty badly by the yeah. looks of things from the from the fall. So uh, a good, good yeah, ways a, to get around the leverage of a larger opponent, go for the neck or vulnerable spots because it takes away their leverage or size advantage. Definitely, it's probably also a good time to note as well that John McLean is indeed not wearing shoes. And the reason he's not wearing shoes is because he was taking that dude's advice from earlier on about making yeah, he's, he's his reflexing his toes, his and un- toes and feet. And unfortunately he had to he had to duck out of that situation in a hurry, so he didn't have time to, to put his shoes on. We even get a nice little moment where we are checking the, the shoe size of the guy he's just killed, in which he lands another great line. It's like you know, millions of terrorists in the world, and I got to kill one with feet smaller than my sister. <laughs> and the whole shoes thing does come up again later on, which we'll touch on in a particular scene. But ha- having watched this film quite a few times over the years, I do think that him not wearing shoes actually enhances his survivability. Because like a ninja, when you're not wearing shoes, you can sneak in around a lot quieter and people don't hear you as much. I think it actually helps his chances of living in the film. Yeah, up until up until the point where, and we will get to it, we won't spoil it yet, but up until the point where there's an actual moment where the fact that he does not have shoes really fucks him up, yep. up until then, <laughs> it is actually a real stealth advantage. And like you said, you can creep silently through corridors, you're not making... Yeah, Metal Gear Solid style. Exactly, he's got some, uh, he's got some sneaky, solid snake abilities when he's shoeless. Yeah, we'll go on to the uh, uh, next bit here. And the um, uh, leads us the into the n- next scenes where the news is reporting that something's going on, but they don't really know the facts. And the terrorists are still hacking into all the different... There's multiple locks and different systems with this big crazy vault downstairs that's got backups and backups and all sorts. The police get called in, and later on the FBI get called in, but they don't know what's going on. They're in such a crazy high-rise... They can't actually see what's going on. It's so high up. They don't believe in the terrorist thing other than John McClane gets on the radio and is like, oh, there's some crazies up here. You've got to get in here. They think he's the terrorist and it's just one guy and he's, you know, being just a nutcase. Yeah, it's a real um it's a real breakdown in communication uh, through all the various authorities that would have a stake in actually helping out with a situation like this. <clears throat> and even we we mentioned earlier about how how John McLean had set off the fire alarm initially to try and draw emergency services to the building. Well, mm-hmm. the the terrorists remedied that situation by literally just getting the guy at the security desk to to call the fire department and tell them it was a false alarm. Um, so 
the next thing John McLean had tried was getting up on top of the roof and, and radioing using the, the walkie-talkie to try and get, get some help. But the people at the dispatch center think he's like a crank caller and they're yeah. giving out to him for violating FCC It's violations. a real movie he's not- thing because in real life, if some, something, any kind of terrorist level threat, somebody's going to fucking check it out. They're not going to be like, oh, he's a crank caller. Don't chance that. Check it out. <laughs> It's it, it, and like once like there's so many great kind of lines and, and moments in in the movie, but the 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 lady at the dispatch uh, kind of center, she's like, you know, this channel can only be used for emergency, you know, communications. Yeah. And McLean's like, no Someone's shit, lady, what the fuck do you think I'm doing? Ordering a pizza? Someone's a sick as shit who's working on that job. Like, look, this movie could definitely only work set in America. If it was set in like France or something, they would have fucked up those terrorists in ten minutes. It would have all been over. Yeah, especially well, like when you look at it from a modern lens, it would have been very difficult for them to get as far as they did in today's yeah. current security climate. But, but, but they um, do do a lot of clever tactics as far as going and stealthily in the van. No one can see them. They're snuck in. Once they're in the building, they lock down all the car park and the building itself. And the, secu- the building has crazy amounts of security. They're even a lot of, I mean, outside of fucking Secret Service and the presidential bunkers and shit, most buildings do not have this level of technology and security. They've got basic fires and fire escapes and locking stuff. This building's got over-the-top amounts of, like, crazy security stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and like like for the time, it was incredibly high tech. It's it's probably a bit yeah. more standard well, fare now, but but back then it was a it was tippy top kind of security you you were dealing with here. And um, we had also at this around this point of the film being introduced to the character of Sergeant Al Powell because the the people at the the emergency dispatch send him round to do just a little drive by on the building to make sure that everything is okay since this guy keeps on radioing them and and, and hassling them so al powell uh he's a twinky enthusiast he he enjoys the odd <laughs> twinky here and there he he rolls on Johnson. round he he rolls on round to, to nakatomi plaza kind of sticks his head in the door the main corridor has a chat with the fake security guard the fake security guard is like putting them at ease saying oh look there's just bugs in the system and it's setting off random alarms and you know don't worry everything's fine and al pile's like oh yeah like you know the hell with this um i'm just gonna leave and get out of here and just as he's um as he's kind of pulling off to to leave the plaza uh john mclean chucks the body of a dead terrorist out the window who he who he dispatched of earlier (laughs) on it it lands on the car it gets the attention, and, and this causes complete chaos because the other guys in the building start shooting at the car, and it's a whole big spiel. And then this is what really leads to all the cops uh, surrounding uh, Nakatomi Towers, and also what gets gets the situation on the news. So other players are kind of now starting to to enter the fold because we've got um yeah, the- Dwayne Robinson, who's like the police chief captain guy who's fucking brilliant in this captain movie he's probably one of my favorite yeah he's he's such a good character he's ridiculous um great fun though he's such an asshole yeah. and uh we got some like swat guys uh, um that we really get to see the swat team that the police send in be absolutely decimated like first of all they try sending four guys in on foot to try and like stealthily cut their way into the building through the main lobby but they end up like literally just getting kneecapped they get their legs shot out from them um through the guys on the inside so then their next idea is to send in the big armored car to to try and rescue the SWAT guys that have already gone in but the SWAT vehicle gets swatted because yeah uh, fires like a crew bazooka or rocket launcher that's right yeah they're like equipped with like rocket launchers like real high-tech uh military hardware and they, they take out the the armored car with ease but this leads to a fascinating moment where john mcclain decides to take action and he he had already had a bag full of c4 which he'd taken off the the guy with the glasses he killed earlier on so he gets the c4 ties it onto a computer screen ties that to uh to one of those wheelie office chairs and just 
throws it down the elevator shaft to cause a massive explosion. Awesome, awesome explosion. Real serious, serious explosion. Blast wipe, 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 wipes out the um the two terrorists that were down um you know shooting at the cops as well. So that's another couple of terrorists dead. One of the terrorists um that he kills as well during that moment. I think it's the guy who's actually shooting the rocket launcher. I'm pretty sure, yeah. and I could be wrong. And look, you know, if anybody's watching this back later, or if anybody wants to look it up, I'm pretty sure that guy is like the same guy who plays Vigo the Carpathian in Ghostbusters 2. Uh -huh. You know, the guy who come the evil painting guy. Ghostbusters he's too. like, yeah, I think he's like the evil painting of Vigo. I think it's that guy. He's this terrorist guy. But anyway, getting totally sidetracked. He's dead, and that's all that matters. John McClane taking care of business. Yeah, awesome sequences. I love the explosions with the C4, which I'll go into a bit more in a minute. I'm going to take a brief break here for just a minute and then be back. And we're back from our moon fighting little break there. Bit of carnage going on on old Die Hard. We get some awesome terrorist action, the police and other um, law enforcement turning up, but not really knowing what the hell is going on. McLean chucks the old C4 down the elevator shaft, and it has some of the, probably the most uh, impressive single explosion scene in the movie. There's a whole bunch of in the movie, but this one is one of the best for as far as the shots we see exploding interiors, exteriors, the windows are blowing out, there's a blast wave, everyone gets scared shitless. <laughs> out on the ground because they've got shards of glass flying towards them from all the way across the street. Hell of an awesome scene. Yeah. Brilliant, a brilliant explosion. It always, uh, it always practical makes me explosion. think. <laughs> yeah, it's a practical explosion. It looks fantastic. It always makes me think, and vice versa when I'm watching the other movie, it makes me think of T2, you know, when the Cyberdyne yep. building uh, gets blown yes, up. It's that yes. type of real weighty, yeah, the explosion spreads outwards and just like it's a big Yeah, it keeps going and going. Awesome. It fills all the vacuum and space in the building until it just blasts out everywhere. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, I love these moments of news footage and interplay between the various kind of news reporters that are, are on the scene here when when all of this is like going jackals. on. And, oh, total jackals. And even... Um, the lady here who also appears on lethal weapon i believe but she's advertising you know it's that book hostage terrorist terrorist hostage <laughs> and they're just trying to like plug some <laughs> professor's book and it's just it's just yeah. it's so funny but yet so Makes me like, Dark Knight like, Returns. Is like here's the expert on the criminals and blah 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 it's like who cares go away <laughs> it's, uh, it's also around this time um we we get to see the end of Poor old Alice, poor old hockey coke yep. snorting Alice gets Alice with an E. He, Alice with an E. He uh, he tries to um to schmooze up to Hans. He's like, oh, I know this guy who's causing all the trouble in the building. You know, so he thinks he, he can treat the terrorists like a like a hostile takeover or a bus, business deal and deal with them. And he's he's completely clueless. Oh, he is he is so clueless, and he's. He's got the he's false confidence of cocaine game. as well, I assume. Yeah, yeah. He, I feel like this is the best example we're ever going to get in a movie of the negative stereotype that is that kind of 80s business yuppie. The golden geckos just of the like, world. Yeah, and, but this guy, like, you know, I'd much rather spend time with Gordon Gecko than spend time yeah. with this Alice guy. Well, he's successful guy at stuff. Seems... You rip people off, but he's successful at doing it. This guy's just an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, and he's a total just like pig headed, ignorant fool. Like the fact yeah. that he kind of um you know, he's pretty quick to dismiss whatever it is he thinks that Hans Gruber is is interested in. He's like, I don't care about your politics. I watch sixty minutes, I don't care if you're angry about what's <laughs> happening in Asia or Northern Ireland. He just runs through all these kind of topical political crises crises that are going on at the time. And and, and Hans Gruber is pretty smart because he plays everybody pretending to care about political stuff that he doesn't give a fuck about yeah yeah and you know so hans they 
they set up the call between Alice and John and Alice is like, oh, come on, John, just, you know, quit doing what you're doing. You know, we're old friends. And John's like, Alice, old friends. all these people. Never met before. <laughs> yeah. Tell these people, I don't know you. I don't fucking know you and all this stuff. So the whole thing just completely breaks down. And uh, for Alice, he, uh, he gets a bullet to the head for being a time waster. So, yep. Time waster, and even even if Rickman believes his bullshit that he was an old friend, he's like, okay, we'll hurt you, and maybe that'll get some leverage against McLean. But either way, it doesn't work out for him. Yeah, it was a bad, it was a bad move. It was a real bad move on on old Alice's part. And it uh, leads to more a... of the um, cap, the police is it police captain? What the hell his name is? The guy that's just I a think terrible, he's a, I, terrible he's, double. Yeah, he's either a captain or a chief. I always get the two. Yeah, um, I'm assuming he's a captain. Like I always get the two. The most them. clueless guy as far as operational procedure and terrorist negotiation. He does everything wrong, and it's quite, it's a bit comical. But he's a good actor and really kind of hams it up. And we get the other we specialists that come, come in. Yeah, yeah, no, I just I have to, uh, yeah. So Dwayne T. Robinson, this this captain of the cops character, like he's such a, for want of a better term, like he's just a walking fuck up. And like you've said, he's handled this whole situation up until now really, really poorly. And it's also around this time that he realizes that al powell has been talking to john mclean kind of over the walkie talk and he's like yeah. who is this guy you're talking to and like you know he's probably one <laughs> of the terrorists and he just let that guy die and he didn't do anything and this and that and he's just he's the guy who's actually helping you idiot <laughs> yeah but he has but uh dwayne robinson he has a great line because al powell's like you know he's one of us he's a cop and the guy's response is jesus christ powell he could be a fucking bartender for all we know <laughs> And they do, um, I don't know, later on there's something they verify his credentials, but it's like, well, he's a cop from another city. Like, you know, he's not from our town. And we still don't trust him. We know he is a cop. And it's like, just, just idiots. <laughs> yeah, and uh, like you say, though, we're also introduced to the, the FBI guys, Agent Johnson and yep. Agent Johnson. What do you think of the two Johnsons? Uh, well, I'm going to get some stuff and clean the ears out just hearing those names. Yeah, we'll get uh, some baby, baby, no, no tears, baby shampoo. <laughs> Johnson and Johnson, no relation. Yeah, good, good actors though. I really enjoy seeing these guys just kind of hammered up in these scenes. Yeah, the bigger, um, the bigger of the two Johnsons, as odd as that sentence is to say, the the big Johnson <laughs> is played by by Robert Davi, who's a he's a awesome. classic actor of he's got of a face of favorites. he's got that memorable face yeah. appears in other classics such as predator 2 raw deal maniac cop 2 you know oh, all the man. all the greats <laughs> but uh yeah the fbi guys they they arrive and you know you you, you get so like usually you know when the fbi is called in that's usually a sign that like you know shit has escalated it's gotten out of hand and now the FBI some structure and order and not more chaos <laughs> yeah they're gonna they're gonna step in and they're actually going to, to fix the situation yeah, except in, in, this, in this situation though the fbi are in fact not going to fix the situation they're going to make everything just a couple worse of cowboys <laughs> Yeah, they're going to play into the hands of Hans, no pun intended. Yeah, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, like to the credit of um, Hans Gruber, our sort of fake terrorist who's just out to um, be a pirate or rob all the riches in the basement that he knows are there because he's you know he's, he's done a lot of research and intel. He's he's miming being a terrorist. Meanwhile, he's doing a robbery that another um, law enforcement knows knows about. But Hans Gruber knows. And the level of escalation, you know, sort of your Grand Theft Auto Vice City style, well, we've got one star, the police are here. We've got two stars and the SWAT's coming. Three stars, oh, shit, the FBI is coming. He knows the escalation and tactics of how they're going to respond and what they do, and he's the countermeasure for each thing. But meanwhile, he's just distracting them. Even when it gets to the level of the FBI, he's still just distracting them from what he's actually really doing, which is just robbing the um, building and getting it, buying time to get into this ultra high-tech vault with its riches 
Yeah. I mean, and he I'm does like pretend to be day. an American when he runs into McLean in, in person as well. <laughs> yes, he pretends to be Clay. Bill. One of the hostages. Clay. Oh, Clay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and that's a nice little moment as well of of interplay. Um, between and you get the McLean doesn't buy his bullshit. Play. He's kind of playing along with them, going waiting for something to happen. Yeah, oh, it's um, it's a brilliant moment, and he and he hands him the pistol. Yeah, which of I love course, when he gives him the gun. Uh, yeah, it's unloaded. Not this. Not that old hands realizes. No, um, I think and though uh, it kind of shows that he's who, not a real terrorist because if he'd used anyone who's handled weapons enough if you've got an empty fucking gun you would feel the difference in the weight it tells you that he's he's a bedroom fucking terrorist he's not someone who's out shooting and using guns regularly or you know that that he could fuck with them that easily by giving an unloaded gun you also see though how ruthless he actually is because Oh, he must pull the trigger <laughs> he, he pulls the trigger on that gun like five or six times so you know he was yeah, just going to yeah. like he just, was in going case. To nail just in case him, like, it was a deer hunter gun, maybe the last chamber yeah. had a bullet in there. Yeah, he, he would have no issue just like unloading that clip right into John McLean's face yeah. and chest if there had been bullets in the gun. Because he was going to get oh, that he, C4 he, back no matter what. Yeah, he's definitely got no issue with killing people. But yeah, it leads us into our next scenes where they're um, still getting away, hacking away at all its old security systems and whatnot. We get the infamous scene where um, McLean is on the run. Some of the terrorists catch up with him on the upper floor, firing the machine guns. He's firing back. The windows get all shattered everywhere, all around his feet. And he has no choice after he shoots some of the guys to um, run through all the broken glass, which is a callback to our earlier scene where he's taken his shoes off. We see the close up of his feet and get a lot of blood dripping around. And it makes it quite gruesome and like you really wince as um the second part of the scene where he's picking talking on the radio to his cop mates downstairs and picking bits of glass out of his feet it's just like it's it's, it's disgusting you your stomach squirms watching that brutal it's brutal and like you know i remember as a kid um getting like a nail uh stuck through the bottom of my foot and how painful and horrible <laughs> yeah, we'll be was. there and uh you know i could only imagine what it would be like to be like have your soles of your feet completely completely cut up by shards of glass yeah. it must be incredibly painful and um yeah just uh yeah just you really really feel for him this is around the time where you kind of begin to take stock at just everything he's gone through up until now because he's been He's been doing hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's been in shootouts. He's been, he's been surviving. Been a long and flight. He's got jet lag and tired. Yeah. And now his feet are all cut up on top of everything else, you know, and he's he's sitting there in that bathroom and he's, like, washing the blood off his feet and, like, crying shards of glass out. And you just kind of just like, wow, this guy has been through a lot. And yeah. uh, It was meant to be his Christmas meantime, and reconnecting with his wife. Instead, you got this bullshit. <laughs> Oh man, worst worst Christmas ever for John McLean. Obviously, mm -hmm. he'd have an even worse one, but we'll get to that another time. But yeah. uh, we also get to see the the FBI guys out in the street going through the playbook. They're kind of bullying a local electrical worker into shutting down power for the the blocks. Uh, it's like ten blocks. Yeah, they're not supposed to do it, but they bully him into it. They bully him into it, which of course a... is the standard um, FBI playbook apparently is to cut the power like a false emergency because they don't really believe what's going on yes yeah and they're looking at, at it from the point of gaining entry to the building to free the hostages whereas on the inside of the building once the power is cut that will also cut the final lock to the vault which is yeah all like our good friends that's right that's right and it's uh yeah, they so they play right into the hands of uh, Hans Gruber's crew. Essentially, they they do everything they need yeah. to do. It, sh to, it shows that uh, Hans Gruber's done a lot of research and intel for probably months leading up to all this crazy heist. We got the great kind of piece of classical music as well when the the vault opens and. I don't know. I always get maybe maybe there's a little bit of evil thievery in my blood as well because I always get giddy with excitement when they rush into the vault and start like opening up all the, all the little boxes well, of beer. Because like, 
before they even get into the vault, on the outside is all kinds of um antique antique samurai armor and artworks yes. and other priceless stuff that they just ignore. So there better be something pretty good in the bloody vault. Yeah. I would, I like, don't get me wrong. I know they, they probably want the bearer bonds because they're going to negotiate the highest price. I would have been walking out with that Japanese samurai armor on me, <laughs> fully dressed in it, like completely head to Just toe. Like, out the me. Spot me, really. Yeah. As I would make my grand escape. Just give me a samurai armor, rocket launcher, and I'll be good to go. But uh, we're also. We're also leading to the big showdown between uh, John McLean and and Carl as well, because you know that yeah, that dude yeah, with the glasses that did he, yeah, the the first terrorist he killed was actually Carl's little brother. So now um, there's going to be the big showdown. Always love that um, Carl in this movie is armed with like an Og Steyr rifle. That's actually like. Mm -hmm. what the irish army use those, those uh -huh. type of rifles they're, they're pretty brutal and the former the former call of duty player and me was also a fan of using that gun on on the battlefield as well so i always like seeing carl in this movie uh using it but um he uh he confronts he confronts john and you know he lets it be known that it's not business it's personal and they have a <laughs> big fucking kick-ass brawl and it's pretty fucking brutal like and yeah, you know look like, cool uh, yeah average sized man bruce willis just can't fucking compete physically with buff german dude so he's getting the shit beat out of him um for ages it's not until he yeah they get knocked through pellets and all through the like um industrial kind of levels got all sorts of shit everywhere and we get more stairs and he's karate kicking them but it's actually more of a ballet kick but it works on screen yeah well look a uh mclean definitely gets lucky he's lucky that that kind of area they're fighting and it's got the the kind of poly chain deal so he's yeah. able to get them all fucked up and hung off that which at the time we think is going to be the end of coral but we'll we'll know a little bit more about that later on we also I mean, get he this should be dead he should be choked out it's a bit of a movie thing that he's not <laughs> yeah well, he might have that like Chris Benoit style neck that's just so muscly. Oh, he could, yeah, maybe, maybe he's got the old wrestler neck. <laughs> that was a strong dark hanging. <laughs> but um, yeah. So shortly after this, though, uh, John he makes his way just to the like roof. Just like Sega. Oh. <laughs> he uh, now the guy's like, I was in roof. high school, asshole. <laughs> yeah, brilliant fucking line. Brilliant line. It's like. Yeah, just like Saigon, eh, Slick? I was in junior high, dickhead. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so um, it's it's just that this movie is so clever in how they kind of set up everything. So, obviously, like, John, he's trying to, uh, he's trying to scare the people to get down off the roof because he knows the roof is going to blow. But, like, the only way he can do that is to shoot his machine gun in the air to kind of panic them and, like, rush them towards the stairs. So of course yeah. the FBI guys interpret that as like, oh, there's a terrorist on the roof, fucking it's shooting at the earth. hostages. Um, unfortunately though, for Agent Johnson and Agent Johnson, their helicopter the is just rigged. a little bit too yeah, it's a little bit too close to that roof uh when it blows. Uh John manages to escape by doing that classic swinging from the fire hose and crashing through. Yeah, we get to see thing. his bloody feet hitting that of glass window before he shoots it out to and, it, and it's meant to be shatterproof well. so he can't get through it it's a that's a great moment i actually i um, should say suicide proof going by robocop stuff yeah yeah but because you can see like he's he's literally whacking off it, and you can nearly like feel the glass trembling with his bloody feet like yeah. kicking off it, and then like whipping out the pistol and like shooting the shit out of it just to try and break it and then there's that other tense moment where the um the hose is still wrapped around him, so he has to like like untangle himself before it like fucking yeah, pulls him out the, the when the spool comes flying down after him and starts pulling him down. Yeah, it's uh it's hardcore, like it's hardcore all the way. Um right, same. we got a nice uh a nice moment though for um for Argyle to be heroic as well because he's been down in the basement the whole bloody time. 
the whole time, but he gets to he gets to ram the escape ambulance that Theo was driving. He rams it and he punches Theo and knocks him out as well. Because he was which, listening uh, on the police bed and radio and figured out what was going on. Yeah, which by the way, um, once again, just to commend Hans Gruber on a on a well worked out plan. It was great that they had an ambulance lined up. Um, as a vehicle to escape in. Because you know once all this chaos is going on, there's going to be a situation where if everything had gone to plan, that roof would have blown up. Loads of hostages would have been killed. It would have been like out and out chaos. There would have been like emergency vehicles everywhere. An ambulance is like a perfect vehicle to just kind of slip by unnoticed. And, you know, if all things had gone to plan, that ambulance would have been filled with... uh, bearer bonds and all sorts of whatever ill-gotten gains they got out of that vault and they would have been home free. Yeah, he's a master planner, old Hans Gruber. Well, we're, yeah, we'll uh, get on to the getting close. next part. We're getting close to the big, big showdown. Yeah. Uh, you saw there in one of the last slides as well, McLean, he's running damn low on ammo, I think is... His little MP5 submachine gun that he's been rocking around most of the time is like fuck all bullets left, and he's only two bullets left in the in the Beretta. We uh, we got to see him. He kind of he tapes his he tapes his pistol to the back of his neck as well before. Yeah, uh, a little bit of the last flu. And I, you know, we should um, you know, as much as a kind of deep thinker and clever guy that Hans Gruber is, we really have to commend um, John McLean himself for being like a quick thinker as well, because this is all really kind of like guerrilla warfare turned up to the extreme yeah. and him thinking. You can even uh, um, almost credit Hans Gruber for helping him with this whole tape the gun to the back of him, because he makes jokes about him. He's like, who are you, Mr. American, Mr. Roy Rogers, Mr. yippee ki Like. And he really plays into that at the end. It's like, like, oh, I'll, I'll have this face off with you, almost like the old quick draw in the Western. And Hans Gruber doesn't expect that he's got an extra gun taped to his back. Yeah, so he kind of helps set him up for it. And yeah, because because uh, he obviously he's got he's got his wife Polly there as a hostage, so he yeah he drops he's the like, MP5. I'll be the honorable machine. hero. Yes, again, full. <laughs> yeah, and it's just it's such a quick draw action, literally like. Hand behind, bang, bang, you know, and because um, he, I'm pretty sure he gets a headshot on the other terrorist, doesn't he? Like he literally gets some bang straight through the eyes, and uh, the other shot, the other shot gets Hans, but he falls backwards while while grabbing Holly. So there's the whole, oh shit, she's going to go out the window with him, which thankfully doesn't yeah. happen. But we do get that brilliant moment of realization of Hans when he realizes he's falling, and we get the whole slow motion. Uh, yeah. do, do you know what I, awesome. one of the things I love about this scene is it's slow motion, he falls down, we get the close ups. And what we do not get is the OCP weird, weird fraggle arms as he falls down. We don't get that in this yeah. movie. You don't and I kind of look for it in case it's there, but it's not, it's not in there. It's not in there because I think for this bit, they actually did a bit of optical trickery where they, they dropped him about like 20 feet. They dropped him for real, eye. but on like a, um, like, I think it's like a composite thing where they put him on a background, yes. but they took they drop him for real. So that expression is like, oh shit, I really am falling. It's it's real. Yeah. But that but like, it's, time it's not distillation important. thing is awesome. It's not over yet though, because as uh, John and Holly make their way outside the, the Greece Al Pale in person, we realize that Carl is still alive. He fucking rises Bloody from Carl. the dead. Rises from the dead. He's still got his not only did he survive the um the hanging type of deal, he also managed to hang on to his fucking assault rifle as well. Because like when he stands up, he's just <laughs> holding the motherfucker right out there. But then uh thankfully Al Powell is there with his fucking dirty Harry Magnum to just yeah. blow the absolute he, piss out of him. And he says earlier in the film he hasn't fired his gun or shot anyone in quite a number of years because he, he shot some kid or somebody who didn't actually have a gun in the dark and it's kind of haunted him ever since. So it's kind of his character moment where he knows like he has to get over his own fear and trauma because if he doesn't, McLean's going to fucking die from this cold bastard. 
when he comes through in in flying colors he's the yeah. he's the hero of the day it's actually um now to just say it it's it's a really kind of nice story that al powell has in the movie as well i know we didn't dwell well, on it he, he would have post trauma right? stress from that wrongful shooting which does happen unfortunately to police in the in the dark of some someone whips something out of you you've got no choice but to shoot them you can't see the long distance what the fuck it is it's nice for him as well because you know throughout the movie we have kind of seen him being belittled by his superiors and yeah. not being taken seriously so for him to actually deliver that kind of final heroic moment in the movie is a nice touch as well like he's kind of come full circle there where he's you know maybe maybe proven to himself that he's still worthwhile and can and can be a an ass kicking cop himself yeah because he's kind of like um i don't know he's been like an active cop for many years but now he's doing lesser duties because he's sort of like lost his confidence and all that yeah, he just got too fond of the old Twinkies and <laughs> with with great Twinkie consumption comes great weight increase, I guess. I only maybe, tried Twinkies. Maybe he accidentally shot years, Urkel. So. That was he got that sick of him, he just accidentally shot him one day. Or Twinkies um, you know, were or were they available in your neck of the woods? I don't believe so, but I knew about them from a young age because of all the um, Marvel comics, which used to have ads, reprints of 70s, 80s ones, Hulk, Spider-Man, Batman. It was Twinkies or Hostess Fruit Pies with more filling. I mean, it's just all like animal extract, fat and vegetable shortening and flour and sugar, and that's a just complete garbage food. But, yeah, I saw the ads for years in comics, but they didn't sell them over here. I was definitely disappointed in Twinkies when I finally tried one because they had yeah. this kind of but the expectation is just mind. so high. Yeah. It's like it's must be this miracle food of the gods. I'm like, no, it's garbage, flour, sugar, and oil. Yeah, hydrogenated shit yeah. with air cream. It's, it's Don't get me wrong. I definitely am. into a food. <laughs> Like they didn't taste disgusting or anything, but they just—I just don't understand how it yeah. would be something you could like look forward to. <laughs> different nah. strokes for different folks, I guess. I mean, you could make a real version of Twinkies, like use like a wholemeal flour, use actual butter and not vegetable oil or yeah. animal make fats. You could make like an a, actual cream a version cake. that had actual nutrition in it. But you need the, you need an official Twinkie if you wanted to survive like a nuclear winter or whatever they yeah. were so famous for if you're in fallout 3 if you're wilhelm toy and hobby and you're going is it flash or batman twinkies and hostess pies and how am i going to survive in this post-apocalyptic new nuclear wasteland break out your, your twinkies yeah and look we've um we've come to the end of die hard but it's not the end of possibly our adventures with john mcclain because you know i i wouldn't no, mind right, maybe even Maybe even for next Christmas season, we we revisit the. Oh, for the sure, we definitely do it next year. When I rewatched this film, like I rewatched this maybe mm, I want to say two weeks ago when I started building the from the show and that, and I was so enjoying it. I got halfway through it and I went, "I'm definitely going to watch Die Hard 2 right after this, like on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon." And I got halfway into Die Hard two and I went. I'm going to watch fucking Die Hard 3. So, so I watched one, two, and three all in a row. No no break, no nothing. Other than going to the toilet, I watched all three in a row. It was, it was, it was, and it was tremendous fun. And as always, folks, you know, I'm sure, look, we, we go through this at a healthy pace. I'm sure we've missed moments and lines and little bits and pieces here and there with yeah. the characters. Because, but look, we, I, I realized that Die Hard. Says you must do all the lines. Yeah. It's it's high up there. Um, it's 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 really like you know well respected and and well thought of. So, you know, if there's anything that you think we missed or could have talked about, or even if there's just any moment or part of the movie that you that resonates with you, and you know, let us know. Stick an I'll stick an I'll comment in there, and one of us will probably read it and respond to it someday. You never know. Might as well. I'll respond to anything. Like if you get on there and go, Johnny, you're a bloody bastard, and I'll go, sometimes I am, but what of it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I won't respond to the email you send me that's like 
20 pages long just calling me a bastard because I disagreed with you about Die Hard. <laughs> well, I'm going to write a new one. It's going to be 40 pages next time, and I'll, I'll make each point notarized. And, yeah. Go on. You said he had a fucking Barada pistol, but it's actually a cool 45 or some shit like that. I don't know. <laughs> I thought, I you thought said it was Maisie, gun. but Quite you meant great, to say Tia. Actually. What's that? She just said it was Maisie, but you meant to say Tia. You know, I'm going to write this fucking essay. Tia, Maisie, Maisie, Geppetto, Pin Pinocchio, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, I, I do love like this film is I think very well written, well shot, good acting. You got Bruce Wallace in full on moonlighting mode where he's still got his hair before he transitioned into his full um, you know, bald head mode, where he still had quite a number of good movies before he went into the real B and C grade Steven Seagal level of stuff. But yeah, good cast, good action, awesome film. And it really stands up to being watched again and again. Excellent, uh, intense soundtrack as well. I think I should also yes. mention really, really good um, music in this movie. And uh, yeah, look, I definitely be up for from next year. You know, taking a little trip to the Dully's airport to to pick up Holly McLean on oh, her flight sure. home and bring her home for Christmas. Watch out for he that general man. Him. Yeah. Maybe next year that general will get his own. AI art deal with this one. Old Hans Gruber. Hans Gruber. Hans Gruber. He should yeah. have, um, Alan Rickman really should have been a James Bond villain and one of the Bonds. Oh, it's for a fucking sure. Like, great actor. Great actor. I love him on old Galaxy Quest and other stuff. And it was in that Kevin Smith one too. What was it? Dogma. He was in that one. But awesome actor. I wish he was in more films, but like the things he is in make his, um, I don't know, it makes his appearances more meaningful, I guess. He plays uh he plays a pretty good uh mm. Eamon de Valera, the first president of Ireland in the movie Michael Collins in the mid nineties. He does a pretty oh, really? good I don't know yeah, who's on that, but I haven't watched that movie in like twenty years. That was out when I was on bloody high school. Um yeah. and uh, and unfortunately Adam Alan Rickman did die of quite a, a few years back, like relatively young, so it is sad because he is an absolutely fantastic actor yeah he was he made the character of hans gruber uh, an iconic villain and yeah. uh you know speaking of old hans eventually you know because after we tackle die hard 2 we will eventually have to tackle die hard 3 and then we'll get to meet hans's brother simon gruber are you die trying hard to get 2, me so. killed motherfucker yeah that's something to look forward to <laughs> Yeah, Die Hard 3 is awesome. It, it, I, I remember when Die Hard 3 um, first came out um, back in, I don't know, whenever the fuck it actually came out. I remember thinking, what, they're doing a Die Hard 3? That's a bit cynical. And then I watched it and went, oh, this is bloody awesome. And it was in that time where you could have a movie or a franchise where it was quite a number of years and do something later on, like, I don't know, a Lethal Weapon 2 or whatever or a Terminator 2, and it was still good. But then it's like when 10 years or 15 years goes past and then they do a sequel to something, it's always some shitty, cynical movie nonsense, bad cover version that has nothing to do with the old ones. And like, there was a time when you could do a number two or a number three and it wasn't a piece of dog shit. It was actually reasonable. And Die Hard 3 is like that exception where it should have been bad, but it's, it's just so damn good and so fun. And Samuel Jackson is still in that early career mode where he's just that angry black man, which which he becomes a cl cliche of in other films, but he genuinely is that angry black man. And he's very authentic in that film. Like, you know, this crazy white dude's going to get killed in Harlem. I'm trying to protect you, stupid ass. It's a great role for, for Sam L. Uh, no, one I'm, it's definitely, it's, it's one I'm looking forward to tackling. And, you know, it's not a, Unlike Die Hard 1 and 2, it's not confined to that Christmas space. It's more like a summer spectacle. Yeah, they get out in the open all over the place in New York. Yeah, we can... And that's uh, half the fun of it. Exactly. So we'll, we'll, we'll not be tied down to a calendar period. Die Hard with a vengeance. It can just come out of anywhere, you know? Yeah. We'll definitely do those ones. Well, we're going to finish up there, I think. All right, folks. Well, look, happy Christmas and... Happy New Year or 
whatever holiday you celebrate, whatever you're into. If you don't celebrate anything, that's cool too. Uh, mm -hmm. You should still watch Die Hard though. That's true. And Simon says, you'll have 60 seconds to play the intro, McLean, or the bomb will go off. <laughs> 